Trade Representative of the Russian Federation in the United States, Mr. Alexander Stadnik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dmitry. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning for everybody here in the United States and uh, good, good evening for all in Moscow. But Moscow never sleeps. It's my great uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to uh, today's event organized uh, close cooperation with uh, our uh, business as well, uh, governor and officials, uh, official partners. Uh, so let me begin with uh, thanking by, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, international uh, company uh, Schneider Group but uh, uh, operating in many European and Eurasia countries, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, our IT company, AB, that uh, was established uh, about 20 years ago in Moscow State University and now uh, operating uh, all over the world in many countries, including the United States. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, all our presenters uh, uh, from the uh, Ministry of Economic Development, uh, from uh, Russia, uh, Russian Institute of uh, Procurement, from uh, Russia Compliance, uh, Compliance Alliance, uh, uh, our partners uh, of uh, U.S.R.B.C., uh, U.S. Russia Business Council, and uh, U.S. Russia, uh, US Russia Chamber of Commerce, and my uh, especially thanks uh, uh, to all attendees uh, who uh, join uh, our event uh, today. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Russia Federation is carrying out a series. Uh, uh, measures aimed to combat uh, foreign bribery, both at le legislative level and uh, uh, in the sphere of anti-corruption uh, policy enforcement. A special role in this process is played by the interaction uh, between the state and uh, business. Federal executive authorities uh, actively working uh, on the implementation of highest uh, anti-corruption standards. Uh, this work uh, also includes uh, activities of a working group organized uh, by the Ministry of Economic uh, Development of Russia. So with why, uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to pass uh, a word to my colleague from uh, the Ministry uh, to Ekaterina Latipova. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Ekaterina Latipova from the Ministry of Economic Development of the Russian Federation. Uh, good morning and good evening, dear colleagues. First of all, I want to thank the Russian Trade Representation and the Schneider Group for today's opportunity to take part in this event and greet all the participants who show their interest in this problem. And as I represent the Ministry of Economic economic uh, development, my speech is about Russian uh, government experience and efforts to organize partnership with business community in the anti-corruption sphere. And also I'd like to say a few words ab about Russian experience of uh, co-working with the OECD and the impact of this cooperation of, uh, on our anti-corruption policy. So I think it's um, it's not uh, news that fighting corruption is a key condition to um, of building effective economies and uh, well-being of countries and the uh, basis of social stability and many other uh, things. And today we see a great trend that many international organizations such as the UN or the OECD uh, develop international anti-corruption standards. And um, the OECD is uh, playing a very important and I should say key role in this process. And uh, I'm talking about the OECD in particular because uh, countering corruption is one of the priorities of uh, cooperation uh, of Russia and uh, this organization. So when we discuss anti-corruption standards of doing business, development of compliance in Russia, we should take into consideration great experience uh, which, we, uh, which was gained during our together work in the OECD working group on bribery in international transactions. 
And this working group has become a platform for discussion of anti-corruption measures and activities and implementation of the OECD anti-bribery convention in uh, Russian legislation. And uh, uh, the convention had a great uh, influence on development of anti-corruption legislation in many countries. And Russia uh, hasn't been an exception in this process. And provision of um, the OECD anti-bribery convention were inco incorporated in our um, developing anti-corruption legislation. I won't uh, go into details on every legal act of uh, Russia uh, concerning anti-corruption measures. Uh, I just say that uh, joining international anti-corruption conventions such as the OECD anti-bribery convention or uh, the UN convention against corruption uh, had an impact not only uh, on anti-corruption rulemaking. It influenced the process of establishment of uh, governmental and uh, anti-corruption institutions and development of um, formation of scientific and expert uh, community and development of partnership between government and business. And this is uh, what I'm going to tell you about. So um, I briefly, I will briefly mention some of the most successful as as we. Um, as we uh, believe, uh, projects in this area. So uh, a most significant uh, amount of anti-corruption uh, cooperation between business and uh, Russian government is being done on the platform of working group of representatives of governmental bodies and business community in together's work uh, in the um, anti-corruption sphere. And this working group is coordinated by a Ministry of Economic Affairs. And it is uh, the main goal of this group uh, is to provide a practical participant of business community in federal anti-corruption policy. And this uh, ministry working group uh, was a platform, it turned to be a platform for mm, some mm, serious uh, initiatives of business and of governmental bodies in the sphere of anti-corruption efforts. And the first one is the anti-corruption chapter of the Russian business of 2012 and the main principle of this chapter are uh, focused on countering corruption and based on international anti-corruption standards such as the OECD anti-bribery convention and the participation in this chapter has uh, a rep uh, it's a reputation a reputation value because joining it and following it it um, shows that the company is a reliable partner and is ready to is willing to have a reputation of a fair player and is willing to develop a um, so transparent uh, business environment. And uh, the working group, uh, so it is a platform, it was a platform um, of four guidelines. Um, they were created by Ministry of Labor and uh, Social uh, Protection. And the guidelines for development and adoption of measures by organizations to prevent and combat corruption. And these guidelines are made to help the business to organize the anti-corruption work and uh, use um, and to form to um, to create their corporate ethics uh, in order to counter corruption. And uh, for the same goals, uh, Ministry of Economic Development distributed among Russian business community the OECD good practice guideline uh, guidance on internal controls, ethics, and compliance. And uh, so uh, we see that in Russia there is a really significant legislative and institutional base, and there are many, many tools uh, which are made to help uh, the business community to uh, develop a fair and competitive business environment. And uh, it's quite obvious that the whole complex of the awareness of business about state and international anti-corruption policy. And that's why this year, 2017, Ministry of Economic Affairs has initiated a really unprecedented in the scope and number of participants uh, anti-corruption educational campaign. So what it's about, it's like, uh, so let's say that it is, um, it has two levels. The first one is inside the country and the other one is abroad. And inside the country, we initiated our big um, uh, business associations of uh, big uh, business and of uh, SMEs. 
and we uh, initiated them to organize uh, special educational and anti-corruption uh, events all over uh, our country. And these are events, they, they are made to explain uh, anti-bribery, anti-corruption law, international and Russian as well. And some of these business uh, associations, such as Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, have their representations in the regions. And therefore, the events are organized practically in every federal subject. So it helps us to involve more and more participants, not only big companies, but small ones, and uh, to involve um, more uh, companies and more business. And what about the international level? We also initiated trade representations of the Russian Federation uh, in almost 50 countries all over the world and in the USA as well uh, for organizing an events for uh, Russian companies doing their business abroad and for foreign companies who have partners or work in Russia, and the main goal is to is the call for companies to minimize corruption risks, including bribery foreign officials, to implement and take uh, efforts um, and take into consideration uh, international and uh, national requirements of uh, Russian and international law. Uh, such as the UN anti uh, the UN Con convention against uh, corruption and anti bribery OECD convention and develop uh, we call the companies to develop and use anti corruption standards ethics and compliance uh, which we are going to discuss today in details. And information about the most um, important, most uh, interesting events you can find on the websites of our trade representations. And in, in the conclusion, I just want to say that we believe that making partnership between government and business and involvement of business community in anti-corruption work, raising the awareness about um, measures uh, and promoting anti-corruption standards, compliance, ethics, we uh, believe that this will uh, help to minimize um, and to counter corruption in doing business. And uh, we are open for successful international experience in this area. And uh, as for me, I'm looking forward for today's representation of our speakers. And uh, thank you for your attention. Ekaterina, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, I would like to now welcome our main speaker of the evening, uh, Mr. Alex Stolarski. He's the Director of Legal and Compliance here at Schneider Group. And Veronika Kochieva. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Dear colleagues, good morning in the U.S., good afternoon in Moscow. Uh, Veronika and I will have a presentation about the anti-bribery, anti-corruption compliance uh, legislative framework in Russia, as well as um, um, a topic about the uh, responsibility of local management to Russian entities and their shareholders for non-compliance. And then we will have a quick look on some other issues. So what we see here, this is the, I would say, famous corruption perception index map of Transparency International. We see that Russia is in dark red, which means the exposure to corruption is very high. The more red, the bigger the exposure to corruption conduct. And that uh, brings us to the conclusion that how, how necessary it is to implement functioning compliance systems in Russia, how important it is to have a functional compliance um, monitoring as well, and what are the mechanisms. And in order to find out, we will have an outline on the legislative framework and discuss these issues, I think, in depth, and then we'll also hear from other experts about their experience in Russia. I will hand over to Veronika now and we'll step in a little bit later again with a few comments. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning to those in the United States. Good evening to those in Russia. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as uh, Alex said, uh, I will briefly guide you through the applicable regulations that a person or, a, or an entity may face um, uh, in relation to uh, any corruption violations. 
So um, the famous uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, UK Bribery Act, federal law uh, number 273, which was adopted as a um, in line with the OECD convention, which Ekaterina mentioned previously, uh, the Criminal Code of Russia and an Administrative Code of Russia. So let me just briefly remind you what is a violation under the FCPA. Uh, this may be bribery of foreign officials or books and records violations. Uh, who may be prosecuted under this law? Um, quite a wide range of persons and entities. Uh, they are U.S. issuers, they are Russian subsidiaries, uh, U.S. nationals employed in the Russian market. Foreign issuers directly listed or with sponsored ADRs and their subsidiaries. Persons acting within the USA and the very, very wide um, position here, agents, which include subsidiaries, joint venture partners, distributors, and so on and so on, uh, and agents and sub-agents of the foregoing. Bribery under FCPA is offering or promising anything of value to or for a foreign official to influence any act or decision uh, willfully and with corrupt intent in order to obtain or retain business or to direct business to any person. Just let me um, add here uh, that a foreign official is a very wide definition. Uh, and uh, the recent United States versus Ashkenazi case, uh, the 11th Circuit, um, defined it as uh, an entity controlled by the government uh, of a foreign country uh, and it must perform a function um, the controlling government treats as its own. For example, uh, there were cases where um, the uh, private practice uh, doctors uh, were treated like uh, foreign affiliates officials, although they are not uh, foreign official, uh, I mean they don't work for government directly. Okay, just a uh, quick look at the UK Bribery Act uh, and uh, the main differences from the FCPA, which uh, are that unlikely the FCPA, UK Bribery Act prohibits commercial bribery and failure to prevent bribery. Actually, FCPA does not prohibit uh, the commercial bribery, uh, because uh, it, it prohibits only, uh, from, from the first look, uh, it prohibits only uh, bribery of foreign official, but the commercial bribery may constitute uh, the violation of the books and records uh, prohibitions. Um, UK Bribery Act does not contain specific intent requirement. Uh, and does not make an exception for facilitation payments or reasonable promotional expenses, which are actually um, included as an exception in the FCPA, but all of them are very narrowly applied, so be careful. Um, the UK Bribery Act does not contain any limitation of, of on fines and it applies to UK listed companies, their sub subsidiaries and agents. Okay, we go to Russian legislation. Um, federal law number 273 sets up an obligation for every legal entity to devise and implement specific measures to prevent bribery. Amongst such uh, measures uh, are appointing responsible persons or departments for preventing bribery, cooperation with the regulators, devising and implementing policies and procedures to due diligence, code of conduct implementation, uh, prevention of conflict of interests, and ensuring inadmissibility of false documents and financial statements. We have a criminal code here um, which defines that a passive bribery, an active bribery, uh, in between bribery, fraud, commercial bribery, attempt of bribery, 
may constitute violation under the criminal code. Uh, Brian is defined as money, securities, property, rights or services for any actions, inactions for the benefit of a briber. Um, criminal code uh, is applied to person, individuals. Um, we go to the administrative code which uh, is applied to legal entities and it prohibits illegal remuneration on behalf of legal entity of any official or manager. Okay, those were uh, the major uh, legal uh, regulations and um, now we are going to discuss uh, what liability um, may face any person or entity are violating those regulations. Um, CEO or general director financial liability. Uh, first of all, uh, everyone should remember that uh, general director bears full financial liability before the company uh, for direct actual damages caused by his or her faulty actions or omissions and for loss of profit also. Under Federal Corrupt Practices Act, uh, civil penalties may uh, be up to 16,000 US dollars per violation, uh, plus other civil remedies generally available to Securities Exchange Commission may be also uh, applied. Uh, aside civil liability, financial liability, general director uh, may be liable under the criminal uh, liability. Under the Criminal Code of Russia, uh, the liability may be up to 15 years of custody and fine in the amount of actual bribe multiplied by up to 70. Uh, of course, 15 years is uh, the maximum uh, liability, um, but it's, it, it ver it's very serious, as you see. Uh, under FCPA, uh, you may face criminal fines up to 250,000 US dollars per violation uh, and imprisonment for up to five years. Russian legal entities uh, may face liability under the administrative code, which may be uh, in the amount of actual bribe multiplied by up to 100, but not less than uh, 100 million rubles, which is approximately 1,785,000 US dollars. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, aside uh, the liability to, of the individuals and uh, legal entities, uh, there are shareholders' liability. Uh, which may be actually uh, shareholder individual liability or shareholders legal entity liability. Um, uh, they may become liable as individuals or entities if they acted on behalf of a company or instructed a company in a, any bribery related interactions or when repairing damages from the company misconduct as a subsidiary liable person or entity. Um, this was a brief overview of uh, probable uh, liability under the law and this brings us uh, to what may be done and should be done to avoid uh, liability under those regulations. Maybe we go back one step again and uh, speak about the liability especially of the the general director, for example. Um, there's recent court practice that says that the general director of, of a Russian entity is personally responsible for the uh, review and choice of business partners. That says that it is not enough, says the court, that uh, the general director only looks into the register and confirms that the company he's contracting with is existent as such, as a legal entity, or that he just got the, uh, the data of the, of the general director, for example, a passport copy or so, that is not sufficient. The court says explicitly 
that business partner due diligence has to be conducted. So, and then by then we see that compliance is not a matter of, of the blue chip companies, of the big companies, uh, but is a matter that is important for each and every company active in the Russian Federation. Um, so, how do we do it? What would be a simple step plan? How can we implement such measures of monitoring uh, compliance in the companies? So first of all, Veronica said it actually by law, it is also defined to appoint someone who is responsible for that in the company. So that should be a sort of local regional compliance officer who, and that is important, is in this function not reporting directly to the general director who is his superior, but at least has a double reporting line uh, to someone in the headquarter uh, so that he can independently fulfill this function as the uh, compliance officer and would have no fear to report any misconduct he's observing. Then we see that many companies on the headquarter level, on the holding level, have a lot of policies in place, code of conduct, policies for purchasing, policies for sales, policies for other issues. But, and, and, then they, and then they say, then they, then they send them out to the Russian entities and say, well, these, these policies you have to, you have to observe. You have to, th these are mandatory for you as well. Um, that is a wrong approach. It should be noted that in Russia, in order to make these policies mandatory in the Russian entities, first of all, they should be translated into Russian language because Russian is the official language. Then it should be checked whether these policies are in compliance with Russian legislation. So there might be mandatory issues of Russian law that prohibit to implement one or the other um, clause in, for example, the code of conduct or another relevant policy. And then these policies, in order to become, again, mandatory under Russian law, and in order to be able to, for example, suspend someone from your employees in case of violation of that procedure, these policies have to be introduced into the Russian company by a special procedure. There's a so-called prikas, an order of the general director, um, explicitly stating the names of the uh, policies, and then all employees have to sign that they have acknowledged the content of the policies, that they have understood what it is all about, and that they agree that these policies apply to them as mandatory. So that's a very uh, important, I think, detail, how to implement policies that do exist um, in, in, in the headquarters, how to implement them into the Russian entity so that it works. Of course, part of uh, the whole compliance impl implementation is an ongoing team training because uh, as, as there's a saying that paper is uh, patient. Yeah? So unless, unless uh, you, you really live the compliance uh, principles, um, th there won't be any compliance. So team has to be stimulated, this team has to be, um, has to be trained in order to understand that compliance is not a sort or not only a sort of control uh, or, or, or a tool to get rid of uh, employees in case of violation, but that this is something that increases trust, that increases transparency, and that um, this is just part of best business practice. Of course, you also have to ensure an effective control and investigation tool, and I think we will hear from our, our colleague from Ernst Young about, about investigations. So this will be another uh, interesting, uh, very interesting topic. But implement the possibility to have a whistleblower that anonymity is guaranteed, that nobody is in fear to report. This uh, maybe re refers to point number one, where at least there should be a double reporting line. So the local compliance officer, he should be able to fulfill this function independently and without fear of being suspended. And you have to imply mechanisms, uh, send people from the headquarter and or to um, assign outsourced counsel to audit regularly. So it's very, very important to internally and externally uh, to conduct these compliance audits in order to make sure that the procedures are working properly and if not, then to adopt and amend them on time. 
and exercise due diligence. So there are certain red flags uh, where the alarm uh, should go on, and um, this refers maybe to, to the introductory words I, I said a few minutes ago. Uh, let's focus on the business partner due diligence. What would be the red flags in case uh, you intend to to conclude a contract with someone, be it a supplier or be it someone, an agent or a consultant, uh, what should be mandatory to look at and what should be something that raises further awareness or the need to ask for the questions in order to fulfill due care as requested by Russian courts today. Yeah, I remind you on the, on the recent court practice that says that the general director is responsible for choosing the business partner and ask questions and understand the financial solvency of that partner and the ability to provide the offered services or whatever. Um, so that is really important. So if the third party, for example, receives, receives excessive commissions, so-called, or any other like, uh, yeah, fees on the side that in the whole chain of, of services or, or, or supplies seems unnecessary. Yeah? So something that is add-on, um, that should be something that, that raises awareness and uh, uh, is clearly a red flag. Or certain success fees are requested. Or um, the unreasonably large discounts being offered. So there are many things that are just too good to be true. So whenever that is the case, uh, you should be um, at least ask for the questions and get a deep understanding of how the contractual scheme is, is uh, structured and who exactly is, is your party. Um, another red flag, of course, is also if so-called consulting agreements include only very vaguely described services. So that might often serve as a reason to justify payments, but in fact um, they are fictional, so there are no services that are being exchanged or being provided in fact. Well, of course, also if the line of business is different than, than the engagement as such, yeah? Um, this is what I meant if I, when I said that you have to be sure that your counterparty can provide really that service, that it has the capacities, that it has the manpower and the knowledge and the technical know-how to provide the certain services or works you request. Well, if the party is related to or closely associated with a foreign official, um, that by definition um, um, should wear, should, should uh, let's say, uh, cause uh, that the alarm uh, alarm is going on because this closeness to foreign officials, this exposure, that is something that is, um, uh, yeah, let's say dangerous in Russia um, because, well, just statistically there is a high um, probability that Corruption involvement is is in place. Yeah. Here. So I mean, I, I don't want to generalize that being being a, being a, a son of a foreign official is something that that, that this is a no go to to have to have contractual relationship with these persons. Of course not. It just requires us or you as the company who intends to get in, in business with these people to have a closer look and to make sure that they operate independently from that closeness to foreign officials, that they can provide these services not because they are the relative, but because they have a solid business. Yeah? So that's the, that's the important point. Well, of course, uh, the other side, if the foreign officials that you are uh, contacting with in the ministries or whatever, if they say, look, we have someone here, you should, you should, you should partner with him, um, well, if they explicitly recommend certain uh, companies on the market, uh, you should also have a closer look at these companies, of course. Well, if it's a shell company or incorporated in offshore jurisdiction, well, that might be, uh, but not necessarily is a, a red flag, uh, but also by definition requires just a closer look in terms of transparency. So if the whole deal is not transparent, that, of course, uh, is a red flag. Unusual payments, if they are requested, um, large bonuses or upfront payments, that would be actually 
a red flag. So this may be just as a short overview. Um, we spoke already quickly about the benefits of a compliance system, but uh, Veronica, maybe you just continue. Um, I may name at least two uh, huge benefits that a company uh, gain from having an efficient compliance system, which I believe is that an effective compliance program can help to prevent a company, its officers and employees from criminal and civil fines, which is a huge benefit. And uh, compliance program, really efficient compliance program, protects uh, its directors and shareholders from personal liability. I think this is a very important fact just to intervene. Um, the risk mitigation by having a compliance program, by having compliance procedures, by having functional policies in place that show the management as well as the employees how to behave, how to rea react in certain uh, situations. I think that's a very, very important tool how we mitigate risks at least. Um, I would like also to mention that uh, by efficient uh, compliance program uh, or an effective compliance program, um, I mean a compliance system which is not uh, perceived by, uh, by the team uh, as a lip service because uh, sometimes that happens that uh, from, a, from a formal point of view there is a code of conduct and there, there are policies uh, but uh, there is none, uh, there is no tone at the top and uh, no one inspires team and uh, people see that this is a lip service so they don't, they simply don't follow uh, all those policies. Uh, I would like here to uh, tell you about one um, case which is not uh, actually uh, connected with Russia, um, but it, it's, um, it's a case which shows us that a compliance program, an efficient compliance program may uh, really insulate company from uh, the claims and from uh, uh, criminal and civil liability. Uh, I have here just named a couple of uh, prominent FCPA cases uh, with a Russia involvement, which are Teva Pharmaceutical and Vimpelcom. You see the huge fines and disgorgements. Uh, we will not uh, discuss them in details. Uh, the UK Bribery Act case in Russia uh, the only one, but it's the huge one, which is Rolls-Royce, and the recent one, uh, which happened in January uh, this year. Uh, but we go to Morgan Stanley case. Uh, I'm sorry for a lot of uh, symbols at this slide, but uh, this all is very important uh, for you just to see it. Uh, and to read it by yourself so you can uh, remember it better. <clears throat> so what is the case? In 2004-2007, uh, uh, Mr. Garth Peterson, this is uh, an open information so there is no need to hide any names, um, which, uh, he was Morgan Stanley's managing director for real estate investments in China and he had a personal friendship and uh, business relationship, secret, of course, business relationship with the former chairman of a uh, young enterprise, a Chinese state-owned entity with influence over the success of Morgan Stanley real estate business in, in Shanghai. So Peterson secretly arranged to have at least 1.8 million paid to himself and the Chinese official that he disguised as finder's fees that Morgan Stanley's funds owed to third parties. Well, at this point we may assume that and we may uh, think that uh, Morgan Stanley was fined and uh, the penalties were huge because, you know, such, such a hu huge deal here. But in April 2012, uh, the Department of Justice and the CAC uh, publicly announced their decision not to charge Morgan Stanley, which was actually the first ever publicly announced decision not to prosecute a company uh, after an FCPA investigation. 
uh, both authorities said that Morgan Stanley would not be prosecuted because of its strong compliance system. Uh, what, um, what was meant by the strong compliance system? Uh, there were evidences that Mr. Peters, Peterson was trained on the FCPA when he was first hired uh, the first day. Then he received at least 35 compliance trainings. Uh, at least eight of them were specifically addressed uh, to the FCPA issues. Mr. Peterson regularly certified that he read and understood and agreed to comply with Morgan Stanley's Code of Conduct which included also an FCPA policy. The first time, it was the first time actually when the agencies uh, publicly announced that uh, the pre-existing compliance program and measures uh, were, were a base for, for a decision not to make enforcement action against a company. Mr. Peterson himself was sentenced to nine months imprisonment and additionally he agreed to pay more than 250,000 in disgorgement and relinquish his interest in the valuable Shanghai real estate, uh, which was valued uh, approximately 3.4 million uh, that he acquired secretly from his misconduct. This case shows us that even <clears throat> in uh, such uh, vivid uh, corruption case, uh, a company may be protected uh, if it had really efficient compliance program, not uh, just uh, some policies, but an ongoing training and uh, certification and uh, other uh, measures. So this is why we encourage you and we um, would, would like every Russian legal entity to um, engage uh, with compliance to become compliant with uh, both international and local regulations. So this is all from my side. Yeah, I, I maybe I add just something a little bit more down to earth, like two minutes um, beyond the Morgan Stanleys of this world. Just a quick example from, from my recent practice. Um, a client of mine called, uh, like, okay, last year and said, well, we have a, we have a, we have a fine imposed on our, on our Russian subsidiary. Uh, it's 300,000 euro. Um, we don't know actually, is it, is it, is it something that is like, like based on facts or is this something, is this the number that, is this something we just have to accept in Russia and how high is the possibility to, to fight this in court and, and what are the chances and so on. So we looked into the case and um, we found out that there were a number of, uh, of agreements concluded between the Russian subsidiaries and so-called shell companies who were obviously created only for the purpose of receiving and forwarding money. Um, this is, I mean, this is the result the investigation uh, over, over a couple of uh, months actually showed high, indi well, indicated. We had no final proof that the general director was really involved, but it all happened under his, let's say, regency. Yeah? He was uh, in charge for the last 10 years. And um, when uh, we approached him, we had the interviews with the management and we asked, um, what was the reason? Why did you choose this company and not, and not another company for, for, for these certain services that you require? Um, he said, well, I met them on a the, on the, on the trade fair and I, I don't know actually, I don't remember. Okay, but you granted them a, a, you granted them a huge contract. Well, huge. It's 15 million ruble um, for a service that if you compare it with, uh, with Germany, for example, that same service uh, can 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 be received for for ten thousand euro, yeah. Um, so so there is a there is a there is a difference in the value. And so the investigation went on, and we found out that uh, that that the number that the tax inspection uh, wanted to, well imposed as a fine is uh, well to big extent justified at least the the the, the 
ongoing court uh, decisions uh, proved that as well so far. Um, um, we, we, we did not represent this client then in court against the tax inspection because we, uh, we, we, we did the compliance part, the compliance work, the investigation. So as a result, um, on a board level at the headquarter, it was uh, decided that first of all, we need to implement that compliance system. We need to, we need to make people aware of, of these issues and we don't want to have these situations in future. So part of that ongoing work that took like eight or nine months altogether was actually to have all these policies that did exist on a, on a headquarter level, but they just sent them around via email and said, well, you have to take care of them. But 80% of the Russian staff did not understand English at that moment. Yeah? So they could not even understand what these, what these regulations are about. So they had to be translated into Russian. There's a specific procedure how to implement these procedures into the Russian subsidiary. I talked about it already. And what the people need to do in order to make them mandatory. So we did all this. Um, and then we had several sessions where we really trained, uh, where we had also a webinar with the, with the colleagues, the compliance colleagues from Germany, and we at the place. And uh, after that, we sent our, from our internal audit service line, we sent our accountants and specialists uh, to that company to sit, with the, to sit with the chief accountant and go through all the payments above a certain threshold that we defined. And then we made a spot check, about 10% of all payments. We just looked at some of them. And we found another very interesting result. So many claims, many, many debts that have been not collected and uh, some other suspicious operations. So it's ongoing. Um, it is already a topic at the board of the, at the headquarter. And it's a very interesting um, development and the people in the entity, in the Russian entity, are also becoming more interested. So they start to call us. They start to ask for instructions. They start to ask for clarifications, how to, how to, how to deal with this or that policy. So it's a very interesting development I just wanted to mention briefly um, before we uh, move on uh, to questions maybe. And I know there was something about sanctions. Yes, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just gonna ask uh, to hold uh, any questions that you may have till the end, till we hear all the speakers. Uh, and I would like to thank Alex and Veronika for such a detailed presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question that was posted by several of our attendees uh, is regarding sanctions. So if an American company is uh, in negotiations with a Russian counterparty, uh, how would uh, they go about actually doing the due diligence behind this counterparty? How would they uh, understand whether their uh, business activity is, falls under sanctions, whether the company is sanctioned, and whether the individuals, the shareholders of this legal entity are under sanctions? Uh, and perhaps maybe briefly uh, speak about this, uh, and specifically pertaining also to the oil and gas industry. Just shortly, if you can, please. Um, okay. Um, as for sanctions, just briefly, um, if you plan to uh, do business in Russia and uh, you so probably may uh, be involved, you, you think so, that you may be involved uh, in business with uh, any entity or person uh, included into the sanctions list, uh, then uh, this uh, is just uh, probably useful information for you. Uh, first of all, um, we have two sanctions list, lists, uh, which are SSI, which is sectoral sanctions uh, identifications, and SDN, which is uh, specially designated nationals and uh, blocked person, persons list. Uh, both those list, uh, lists cons consolidated uh, in uh, the database, uh, which you may find in sanctionssearch.ofac.treas.gov. Uh, this database uh, will provide you uh, with the primary results. So you may do it by yourself. You may uh, put the, uh, the name of a legal entity or a person and check whether it contains, uh, whether it is included into one of these uh, lists. 
If you do want uh, any further information, any further due diligence and uh, details, then uh, I think you uh, would have to uh, involve some uh, consultants probably uh, in, in Russia to identify whether, uh, for example, if uh, the entity or, or a person is uh, not presented in the list, but you still do want, and this is reasonable, to understand whether they have any connections with uh, such persons uh, or entities that uh, are included into the list. So in, in uh, such cases, uh, you are welcome uh, to use also our services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ranika. Okay, I would like to now uh, hand the microphone over to Mr. Denise Korolev, uh, uh, Representative Ernst & Young, and his presentation on fighting corruption in Russia. Mr. Korolev, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thank you. Um, just, uh, just a question. Does everyone see my presentation? Uh, we see it on our end. If anyone uh, okay. does not see it, please uh, send a text uh, to Gregory uh, if anyone's having trouble viewing uh, the presentation. Thanks. Okay. So uh, my name is Denis Karolev. I am a director uh, from uh, Fraud Investigation and Dispute Services Group of Ernst & Young based here in Moscow. Uh, and I would like to start with the fact that on an annual basis EY conducts global surveys to monitor the matters concerning fraud and corruption. And the researchers conduct an average 4,000 interviews with employees of large companies in around 40 countries online or in person. Uh, so that means that in Russia we conduct these interviews on a regular basis with the, about 100 uh, top managers from uh, uh, top companies. Uh, so. Uh, as presented on the current slide, over the last few years, uh, Russia demonstrated a great development in terms of fighting corruption, as in 2013, 82% of Russian respondents uh, considered bribery and corruption to happen widely in Russia, uh, but in 2016, only 34% responded positively to the same question. That may be quite a surprise for, uh, for you, but... Um, there is another improvement uh, that uh, in 2013, according to our research, 56% uh, of Russian respondents indicated that in their sector it was a common practice to use bribery to win contracts, uh, while in the recent year this indicator went down to 8%. So uh, we believe that these developments are explained by the fact that Russia has continued to develop and extend the scope of, either, of its anti-corruption legislation with an increased number of government officials now uh, required to disclose their personal income and potential conflicts of interest. Uh, and Russia also has also maintained a focus on fighting corruption both at the regional level with several governors and officials under criminal investigation and also at a multinational level uh, repat repatriating several well-known businessmen whose fortunes are alleged to have been accumulated through fraudulent uh, schemes uh, and activities. I, I should also admit that um, we personally noted the positive developments based on our project work and interaction with the Russian business. Uh, the local companies are getting more proactive in fighting corruption with the help of improvement of the internal policies and procedures, uh, education and training, participation uh, public anti in public anti-corruption events and others. But today we're going to speak about fighting fraud and fraud investigation itself. Uh, because corruption is one of the types of fraud according to the Association of Certified uh, Fraud Examiners. So uh, there are three types of fraud. Uh, the first one is creative accounting, then embezzlement and corruption itself. So uh, before investigating the corruption, we need to understand the methods of making corrupt payments. So uh, mostly they are represented on this slide. They can be uh, direct cash payments, gifts, travel, and entertainment, uh, meaning excessive uh, travel, uh, meaning excessive entertainment. Purchase at inflated uh, rates uh, when you generate black cash uh, for, uh, for further uh, bribes. Uh, donations to social programs, uh, charities, and so on and so forth. So uh, when we uh, approach uh, the target, uh, the target is uh, 
uh, where we see and the client always our client sees that there may be problems at one of its subsidiaries so we call it the target uh, so we start with the analytical tests when we perform the analysis of key operational performance indicators uh, we check uh, uh, we perform the mass vendor check so uh, my colleagues already mentioned uh, that proper due diligence is required and uh, we can perform a mass vendor check uh, uh, based on certain criteria identifying and highlighting those red flags which help us to review uh, risky vendors for further review uh, then we perform the detailed operations analysis. Uh, uh, it can be in procurement, in sales, uh, in uh, different salary bonuses uh, given to employees, advances given to employees and others. And also we should not underestimate the another source, great source of, uh, uh, of information for, uh, for uh, misconduct and bad behavior uh, perpetrated by the top managers or employees of the company, it, it is hotline. Because according to uh, uh, also our knowledge and uh, also statistics uh, provided by associations certified for examiners, we see that the hotline actually represents about 40% of uh, uh, so it, it, it represents 40% uh, uh, of uh, matters revealed uh, uh, through uh, different uh, uh, detection methods. Okay, so what are the main law, law sectors? And why we are talking about the main law sectors? Because these uh, sectors, they help uh, uh, those who are uh, eager to perpetrate this uh, misconduct uh, who are ready to bribe uh, someone they are used to generate black cash so in 30 50 percent uh, uh, is in construction 15 uh, 20 percent is in procurement 5 10 percent is in sales uh, and um, uh, definitely we'll also need to keep in mind that uh, degree of impact on the business it differs uh, uh, from the fact who is actually doing, uh, who is actually engaged in this uh, fraud. And uh, uh, we have uh, to fight usually against executive and top management of the companies and uh, unfortunately the impact on the business is high. And also as these people, they are wise and smart, so the fraud is also sophisticated. This is why we have to utilize and use uh, some uh, IT uh, tools in our investigation process. Mostly they are represented by mass vendor check, big data analysis tools, and computer forensic or so-called e-discovery services. So what is automated counter counterparties screening? So basically we approach the target, we get its procurement ledger, there we get the information on the names of the vendors, the tax numbers, and also the turnovers, meaning the amounts spent to these vendors. Uh, on an annual basis. Uh, also, we get the list of the employees, and so this data can be used, you know, to perform the affiliation check of these uh, uh, vendors with the current employees, and maybe with those employees who already left the company, if we have that data as well, and that uh, check is not performed on the first level when you actually compare the information from the register of the company, of the vendor where you can get the name of the shareholder and of the, of the director but also we can do it on the second and the third level yes so meaning that uh, if we perform if we perform an analysis of uh, affiliation analysis of why 1000 vendors the system can actually extract up to 30 50 uh, thousand of uh, profiles of these companies and perform that uh, comparison uh, other integrity due diligence criteria used in our uh, in our uh, analysis is represented uh, on this slide. Uh, so, because affiliation by itself is just one red flag, but uh, also if we see that the counterparty is in the process of dissolution of bankruptcy, it's another red flag. If we see that the number of registered con counterparty business activities exceeds 40, that is another red flag. If uh, the company is registered at mass uh, uh, registration address, if it has mass director and others, so these all red flags help us uh, 
uh, to draw such uh, risk map maps so where we can see like bubble you know so that means uh, these uh, companies which are in this corner they were selected based on those criteria used by our uh, by our equipment by our software and uh, definitely that means that we need to jump in into this bubble and uh, we'll have to review what was purchased whether it was purchased on an inflated price or not whether the volume whether we see if there is a vague description of the services performed and so on and so forth so that gives us a good understanding of uh, what vendors we should review uh, other risk maps so this is how affiliation schemes usually look like so here we have affiliated counterparties here we have a conflict of interests between uh, employees. Uh, also, we use automated social network uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, because uh, definitely if you compare just the names uh, of the employees with those names recorded in the uh, corporate registers uh, in, in the modern, modern world, it's not enough. We also need to check the social networks and see whether these people are also somehow connected. Uh, maybe they're friends or just uh, were classmates or groupmates. Uh, also, uh, in our analysis, we don't use only, as I'm from forensic department, basically, I'm not using just uh, accounting records and databases for that review, uh, for, for, for the fraud investigation, uh, uh, anti-corruption investigations, but we also use other data, which is usually unstructured, but that data can actually contain uh, lots uh, of information which uh, may represent, which may show uh, to what uh, more significant risks these companies are exposed to. So we are talking here about email correspondence, instant messaging programs, archives, web page, pages, viewed history and uh, other uh, like Excel, Word, PDF, uh, uh, I don't know, PowerPoint uh, uh, files. So the problem with this unstructured data is that you need to perform its collection, then you need to perform its recovery. Uh, you, we perform the recovery of deleted lost files and emails. Then we perform its analysis and we then present it uh, for our reviewers. And based on the keyword search list, we perform that uh, the review of the uh, big data of massive uh, tons of uh, uh, th thousands of, or even hundreds of thousands of emails. Uh, messages and uh, using the keyword search list we are able to analyze and to get uh, what we are looking for in uh, in a very short period of time so what are the evidence electronic sources so they are uh, here it's usually corporate laptops fixed workstation sometimes it's uh, even the uh, memory from the printers uh, as well so um, uh, I'm not gonna uh, explain what data can be on the corporate uh, uh, computer because I already did it. So uh, in the course of the email analysis, we uh, try to understand who is uh, uh, communicating about what and when. Uh, so these uh, slides also also represent you different waves of representing of the data uh, collected and restored. Uh, I don't have time for that, but I wanted just to show you this uh, example of corporate mobile phone data which shows you and gives you a clear picture of how usually uh, fraudsters in, in Russia or in uh, Commonwealth of the Independent States uh, uh, communicate. So on the first picture you see it. So here we have um, uh, the procurement manager who is asking the uh, service provider, what is your base price? And the reply is, for you it will be 3.10. I have sent you tariffs to Sergey recently. Re uh, Sergey is a logistics manager from that company. I can forward them to you. What price should I propose to Lina? Lina is a subordinate of uh, this procurement manager. And so the reply is, give yours. I don't want to toy with the pocket change. Then he actually asks, we can decrease to three and propose Lina 325. You'll get 25 uh, copics. So it, basically it's not uh, kopeika. Yes, it's not cents. But this uh, here they are uh, using their own wording. Uh, from a pallet with Sergey, no need. So uh, just this print screen shows us that uh, uh, the procurement manager he uh, ended up in a communication with the service provider, uh, we, which uh, which 
shows that w we see bad flavor, you know, we, we smell that something fishy is here. Uh, another slide uh, is uh, also represent the same pattern of behavior. Okay, so uh, I just uh, wanted to give you a, a, a light overview of what we usually do, but uh, right now I'm going to spend like three minutes of your time just to give you a, a, a short uh, business case, yes, just to show you what was done by us. Uh, Dennis, I, I do apologize. We're really running short on time. We're not going to have uh, time for questions. Uh, we're, we're, okay, we're, so, we're... Uh, well, well, so then I'm just, I'm just going to show you uh, the scheme yes okay so what what are the typical schemes so that will take no more than one minute of my of your time uh, so um, uh, the scheme so uh, at this scheme usually uh, so this scheme represents a farm manufacturer uh, which uses marketing services companies to promote its products via healthcare professionals which are officially employed by medical institutions you no know, here and these healthcare professionals, doctors, they influence the decisions made by a medical institution during the procurement process. That is very simple. So on this uh, slide, you see the company uh, which provides kickback payments to government officials with its employees who allegedly receive money as bonuses, salary payments, uh, and etc. And subsequently, the government official will influence the st state-controlled uh, company to sign a contract with, uh, with our company, Vector. And uh, the last uh, uh, scheme is when uh, LRC target, it actually buys equipment of LRC Shelley uh, uh, for inflated prices uh, and subsequently receives free cash from LRC Shelley. For example, 10% from initial payment for equipment. Uh, and the company used this cash to pay bribes, raise salaries, money withdrawal and others. So. Um, uh, I hope you I hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation and if you've got any questions I'll be uh, happy to answer all of those. Thank you. Mr. Karlov, thank you so much. Uh, I would now like to turn your attention to Ms. Patricia Dowden of the Russian uh, Compliance Alliance. Patricia, the floor is yours. Patricia, we, we, we can't hear you. Um, perhaps, Gregory, okay. can we fix? Patricia, just unmute yourself. Just, just click that uh, mic, mic uh, button. I don't know. Uh, you just uh, switch it off your screen, switch on your screen back, and then unmute yourself. Okay, I'm I'm sharing my screen, yeah. but I don't see this. Yes, excellent. We we hear you. We hear you. Full screen, and that's. Uh, but you don't. I don't think. Here we go. Did everybody see the slides? Yeah, just uh, just start the slide presentation mode. Yeah. Uh, do you see the slides now? Yeah, we see the slides. You just want to start uh, them in full screen presentation mode. Are you saying I should do something different here? Yeah, just click that uh, on the bottom, uh, that uh, a little bit to the right, to the right again, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. This one, yes, slideshow. This one. Okay, are we good? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, great. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in today's webinar. It's been quite interesting for me and I will try to be brief because uh, many of the issues that I'm going to talk about have already been covered uh, in a different way by other speakers, so I hope that this will sort of tie some things together. I'd like to talk about the Russian Compliance Alliance, which is uh, it's a self-evaluation model, online self-evaluation model. Uh, it's based on all of these global business uh, ethics compliance requirements that you've already discussed, including Russian law. Um, and it was developed in cooperation with Russian compliance professionals, uh, which started when um, Russia hosted the B20 uh, back in 2013. We presented this idea to them, and it's been it's now hosted by the B20 Collection Action Hub and designed as, not only as a Russian instrument, but as a global compliance instrument. It's been um, adopted by APEC, for example. Um, it is a public good, free to the users. 
uh, that questions are publicly available, uh, and this is quite important because um, some of you will remember several years back when uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service fined Moveable Nordisk for their procurement procedures and their selection procedures, and there was some question at that time as to whether or not um, uh, anti-monopoly was going to conflict with due diligence on um, doing business with third parties. And so um, we've discussed that with FOSS, and they, they agreed that as long as the cr criteria for the selection are publicly available, uh, that it's OK to use screening for, um, uh, for compliance issues. So these are, these are free. Uh, and available publicly. And I don't think there's any other survey that is. There's many other surveys, but they are all proprietary. Um, so this is a multi-purpose tool um, for internal operations of the company. It can be used to educate uh, about the requirements of the law and also for the auditors to go through and see whether or not um, the requirements are being complied with. More important, uh, though, for my discussion today uh, is its value in uh, third-party due diligence. And uh, the reason for that is that this third-party issue, we've already discussed, I think you used the term business partner, but the process of being able to manage uh, and potentially thousands and sometimes ten th tens of thousands of third parties um, to be sure that they're not um, uh, causing you legal difficulties uh, is is quite a big challenge for management. Um, I won't go through all this in detail because I know we're a little short on time, but the self-evaluation covers various aspects of culture, communications and training, monitoring, conflicts of interest in financial management. There's about 150 questions in this survey. So the big challenge is that uh, companies are are legally liable for the age, for the actions of their third parties, their business party, business partners. And as I mentioned, if you're talking about tens of thousands of these, this is a near impossible task. Um, the, the origin of this rather draconian legislation is pretty interesting, and it is that uh, companies were in in the early days of um, developing businesses in emerging countries. Um, one of the things that companies were doing was outsourcing corruption. Uh, they would, for example, if bribes needed to be paid, paid to get uh, products distributed on the shelves, they would just hire somebody to do the distribution and wash their hands of it. And so this, line, this uh, approach uh, to the legislation was designed to prevent that sort of outsourcing of corruption and also to provide some mechanism for um, spreading business practices on a fairly uniform basis throughout all of the uh, participating countries. The big gap is that uh, these, legal com these legal requirements have not been addressed by most companies' response. Many companies don't even understand that they've got a responsibility here. Um, and so the question is, how are they to manage uh, compliant in all of these uh, third parties? The answer is mitigation. Um, that is a minimization of the potential impact of a threat. And you do this by demonstrating good faith efforts to comply with legislation. Um, the early, earlier speaker talked about Morgan Stanley getting off the hook because they could prove that they had a strong uh, compliance program. Um, and this is the issue here is to be able to demonstrate that you have checked compliance programs with all of your third parties. Um, and so we are proposing that uh, in, in the case of third-party violations, a company that has consistently used the Russian Compliance Alliance for third-party due diligence has got mitigating evidence. They've got, they've got evidence that these companies have gone through this um, self-evaluation, have been exposed to what the criteria are, um, and uh, at least they did what they could to educate them. There's the last, uh, another step that, that would strengthen the program enormously, uh, which my colleague Andre Kronken is going to talk about in just a minute, and that's certification. If there is certification of those self-valuations, it strengthens both the mitigation for the buyer, and it also puts the seller in a, in a position of being 
more competitive in the market because they can demonstrate uh, that they are a reliable third-party partner. So now I will turn the floor over to Andre Kromkin. Hello to everybody. Uh, I, first, first, I want to thank Patricia for her presentation, and I introduce Mr. Andre Kramkin of, the, of Russia's Public Procurement Institute. Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Uh, we are dealing with um, government procurement, um, with training government officials, uh, and uh, also we consult government um, entities in the development of the legislation in the field of uh, government procurement in Russia. So, uh, uh, we see uh, the potential of um, um, compliance, uh, anti-corruption compliance control in the field of uh, our government procurement. Uh, first of all, I think it could be used uh, as one of the mandatory conditions uh, for the suppliers uh, when um, government use sole source, sole source contracting. Uh, in, um, and um, as mentioned Patricia, uh, self-evaluation and um, uh, some kind of um, certification is uh, um, rather understandable and uh, effective tool uh, for using uh, all the potential of, um, of uh, compliance. Uh, so uh, just now we are preparing uh, documents and papers and uh, materials uh, for formal uh, procedure of certification of this issue in Russia. Uh, and um, I hope that it will be um, it will be um, we we could we could uh, get formal uh, papers on certification uh, within I think two three months. Yes. Um, till the end of summer. Till the till the end till the end of summer, uh, and. Um, after that, we will see what will what will be going on. Andre, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for presenting, and we are now at the Q and A session. I know, uh, Sergey, did we have we had a few questions that were posted? We had one question that was posted only. I know many viewers had signed on and signed off. Uh, I don't know how many we have online. Gregory, how many do we have right now online? Currently, I have uh, twenty-seven people, including. Okay, all. so ladies and gentlemen. Please post your questions. I would like uh, to ask you to identify, um, uh, you know, your, just your name uh, and uh, the organization which you represent, be it a company okay. or, uh, so, uh, or some other entity. Okay, as, as a bunch of participants uh, have joined over the phone, I don't know if uh, all of them have an opportunity to, to post the question in the chat, so I will just unmute everybody right now and uh, so everybody will be able to speak and uh, yes yeah, so people can post questions uh, uh, online uh, in chat as well as uh, yeah they would be able just to uh, yeah so uh, I as Gregory said, those of you that are uh, listening to the webinar via phone uh, you know don't jump in all at once now but uh, please voice your questions, and those of you that have the ability to write them, please send send them uh, via text. Uh, so please, uh, uh, you know, state your name and the organization which you uh, are representing, and then the question. Hi, my uh, my name is Jan. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, we hear you. Right. My name is Jan Darman. I am chairman of IDF Global. Uh, which is quite active in Russia, and um, it's an, uh, a not-for-profit engaged in fighting corruption. I just wanted to ask a question. Th this is really impressive for me. I've been to Russia uh, about 400 times. Um, the 
the legislation, the compliance programs that are described is is uh, major progress. But I, I'd like to ask, and I asked it in the text, how what progress is there with enforcement? I ask this because a lot of countries I work in, the legislation is good, the compliance programs are good, but enforcement is rather weak and sometimes uh, it is inconsistent. And I was just wondering what progress has been made on the enforcement side in Russia. Alex, you'll take that? Yeah, i take that for it and then maybe I, I, I forward uh, if someone wants to add something. Just a general remark. Whenever we speak about Russian legislation and achievements, <clears throat> the question is, with what do we compare it? Yeah? Do we compare it with Western legislation, where we have a much bigger track record, a much higher experience, uh, a court practice that is established, an academical uh, sphere that is highly developed? Um, or do we look at the achievements that have been made within the past 20 years in Russia? Although it has a great history and a great culture, but the Russia as it exists today and the legislation as such has made, in my opinion, huge steps during the last 20 years. And specifically in the starting, well, I would say after 2000. Yeah? Um, and if you look at that, then, generally speaking, the enforcement and the reliability and the transparency and the possibility to forecast somehow, yeah, to make certain predictions based on already established practice, I think it increased a lot and improved a lot. If you look at the uh, anti-corruption legislation, which is also quite new, um, then we see on certain regional and governmental uh, levels already, I would say, an increased enforcement. Um, you can always claim it's not enough. Uh, it's not consistent enough. And I guess often I would agree with that. But there are certain steps and measures that at least they can be noted and uh, can be seen. And I would not say it's just sort of actionism in order to show off, in order to say that the Russian government is doing something against it, but these are real cases. Um, and we see it also on a federal level. So we can be impatient or we can judge and we can say it's not enough, uh, but we can also look at the other side and maybe acknowledge what has been done so far and do our work in order to promote the, the culture of compliance the good business practice uh, in order to in our companies in our environment and uh, also do our part to improve the business climate maybe someone wants to add something yeah if anyone wants to add Dennis Patricia Andre Ekaterina thank you for that and that's an excellent answer thank you okay uh, anyone else questions I just, this is uh, Earl Rasmussen yeah, with the Eurasia Center. Um, excellent program and, and uh, really very, very, very interesting. Um, and I like the comments previous as well. Uh, my question is just from a perspective. I mean, we've seen uh, from the World Bank perspective and other international things, we've seen improved business, uh, doing business uh, with Russia, environment improving. We've seen legislation going in the corruption, uh, addressing the corruption area. Um, and we also know the 90s was kind of um, maybe maybe no progress made in that direction, the opposite side. But but since 2000, a lot of different progress. So are we still there's a lot of room to be made, and I think not just in, in Russia, but a lot of countries are just from a perspective, just a brief thing in, in your viewpoint. Are we on the right track in Russia? Are they taking the right steps? Um, I mean, from an observer outside, it looks like we are, uh, they are, uh, but, but from your perspective as a professional, and what, uh, what is the most significant thing that needs to be, uh, that needs to be tackled, uh, uh, that could go, because you, can, you can't, you can't solve everything at once. What's the 
most significant uh, step or area that really needs to be addressed uh, uh, to ensure positive progress. So what's the priority? Where's the priority? Anyone who wants to take this one? Dennis, um, perhaps? Patricia? Yeah, I, I might make a comment about this. I, um, on a very personal kind of uh, experience level, this, uh, this Russian Compliance Alliance system that I described earlier was developed in 2013-14 mostly by multinationals. And then Crimea happened and everything, uh, you know, the, all the U.S.-Russia relations kind of went on hold and we were, we were just stalled. Our, our pilot project couldn't start because of that. We were declared a foreign agent, etc. Um, and so it's been a little dormant since then. And, and then to my great surprise and delight, uh, the program is now being picked up within Russia by Russia-related organizations. And Andrei Konkin is, the, is a very important one uh, if, if we are able to uh, pull off this certification thing. This is a very big step forward for us, and it has nothing to do with multinationals. Um, this is, you know, this is Russia. Well, it, there may be some multinationals involved, but this is sort of a Russian initiative. Um, the anti-corruption uh, anti charter of Russian business has expressed interest in this uh, system. The, the federal anti-monopoly uh, service has expressed interest as a way to promote some new anti-monopoly uh, things. So I just find that a very, very interesting uh, example of the way Russian business culture. Uh, and Russian government uh, uh, initiatives are sort of growing and picking things up without being even pushed about it. Anyone want to add? Yeah, basically, I'd like to add, I believe that uh, our country is on the right track because even from our own uh, experience, we see like five years ago when we you were talking about, you know, compliance culture, corporate culture, that you need to implement uh, all these anti-corruption policies and procedures. And when we were talking about this with our uh, local uh, regional countries or uh, regional companies, so actually the top management was like, uh, you know, asking us, why do we need this? Uh, 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 we don't have corruption and we don't need all these policies and procedures and they were, you, you know, ignoring all these uh, uh, good uh, uh, adjustments to their uh, corporate culture itself, which uh, anti-corruption me measures can bring to the to the company. And uh, But now we see that uh, increased law enforcement and it's not just, you know, just uh, 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 that we're just saying that like, there is an, a law enforcement. We see that uh, even one of our ministers uh, currently he's uh, in uh, under criminal investigation, you know, and uh, he can be sentenced up to ten or twelve years. So we see that uh, law enfor enforcement uh, actually made a great step, you know, towards uh, even high-ranking officials. Uh, the companies uh, by themselves understand, understand that they need to implement all these policies and procedures and not just implement but they also need to follow and that is also supported by the fact that they are you know uh, taking more uh, active uh, uh, part in uh, these uh, uh, conferences and uh, these uh, webinars I mean in, in, in such events which we have currently today and also they uh, looking for support uh, to educate the employees, you know, to implement all those, uh, 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 how to say, how, uh, they, to implement all those, um, uh, so they, they are looking, uh, some, uh, they are looking for support to implement all those policies and procedures and they are looking for support to educate the, uh, their people that uh, there is not just Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and United Kingdom bribery act, but there, there is also uh, Russian uh, criminal uh, code and there is also Russian anti-corruption legis uh, legislation. And so actually we see uh, here a very positive trend. You, you cannot compare current situation with what was five or ten years ago. And But definitely there is a big road uh, ahead, you know, and uh, we need to walk another extra mile, you know, to achieve excellence in this sphere, by all means. All right, well, let's hope we're headed in the right direction. Uh, further questions, please.
Okay, I take the silence as there are no more questions. Let's give everyone uh, another few minutes. Gregory, is uh, everyone's microphone unmuted at this point? Yes, everyone. Microphone. Everyone's microphone is unmuted. So, like, people go ahead and ask your questions. If you don't have questions, you may use uh, the email address for the Russia trade representation in the United States, DC at uh, R-U-S uh, trade USA.org to send your questions later. So the same email address that was used to, to inform you about this uh, event. But just in case if you uh, have some question later. So uh, that email address should be also used to request copy of the slide decks that were used uh, for today's webinar as well as to send you any additional questions. But go ahead, ask your questions if you have them right now. We still have like 20 oh, active participants. Uh, uh, Sian again, sorry to, to have another question, but just practically, this is a superb uh, webinar. Thank you all very much, it was really great. Uh, can we get a copy of the webinar itself or just the slides? Because you said the session is being recorded. Yes, uh, I do confirm that we have recorded uh, the entire webinar. I'm going to have to uh, turn to my uh, IT and perhaps Gregory also, I believe, recorded. So um, we'll, we'll make sure to get that to you. Just uh, uh, as Gregory read out the uh, email address, if you can just please send a formal request uh, to the Russian Trade Mission in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, provide a copy of the webinar. And thank you for, for, uh, for complimenting the program. Any other questions? As long as we're waiting for questions, maybe I can come up with a proposal because I like the format very much and I understand this is now being oriented towards mainly American uh, companies and listeners and viewers in the U.S. But um, at least three of the six presented on the screen, I understand, are based in Moscow, right, Ekaterina and uh, Andrea. So maybe we can even meet in person and Denise, I understand you're also in Moscow. So. Uh, repeat that, uh, so sort of a live event uh, in person, uh, gather, a, I think, a very interesting crowd of people and do promote that what we talk about right now and, and uh, provide our part uh, for the improvement of the, of the business climate. Um, if you agree, and I think we, we already know each other, so to say, so <laughs> maybe, maybe we can arrange for, for another joint event. Uh, in, in, in such a different format, maybe as a live format, um, I, I would leave that to Dimitri to, to organize and maybe to follow up on that, but I think it would be, make great sense. Yes, yes, that's definitely a great uh, proposal. Uh, and just to remind all our viewers, uh, this webinar format is scheduled to uh, be a regular webinar. Uh, so this is only the first of many to come. So for those of you that have listened in uh, and have enjoyed and found this presentation to be useful, uh, please do return. We will notify you uh, of the next webinar and the next topic that we will be uh, holding. Uh, I will again repeat uh, uh, the question whether there's uh, anybody there who has any additional questions, comments, Okay, so uh, for those of you that didn't get a chance to pose the question, please uh, send an email to the Russian Trade Mission. Uh, and I want to thank all our speakers uh, for participating and providing such insightful uh, presentations. Uh, and I want to thank all our viewers uh, and listeners that have joined today's webinar. Uh, thank you all so much. And uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.